Hello and welcome to Talks on Law. I'm Joel Cohen. Today we're talking about a recent Supreme Court decision that just came down overturning the ban on bump stock. We have a Second Amendment scholar and a Talks on Law favorite with us. Professor Joseph Bloker teaches at Duke Law School and is the co-director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law. Joseph, welcome back to Talks on Law. Thanks so much for having me, Joel. It's good to see you. It is always a pleasure. This case, you and I had spoken about Rahimi. This was the domestic violence case. I'd been following some other Second Amendment cases. I wasn't even aware that this bump stock case was pending. Yeah, I mean, and and maybe rightly so, because it's technically not a Second Amendment case. Um, It's sort of been reported as as having been a big, you know, maybe big win for gun rights. And I don't think that's exactly right. It's a case about statutory interpretation and about what has been prohibited under existing law, not what could be prohibited uh, consistent with the Second Amendment. So it's really like a, in some ways, like a very narrow uh, debate about just what a couple words in a single statute mean and whether the ATF's interpretation of those words is permissible. I think for most of us, except perhaps a small subset of of gun enthusiasts, were introduced to the word bump stock after the Las Vegas shooting. Maybe you can explain what bump stock is and I suppose how how and when it was banned. Yeah, and actually the fact that this entered your consciousness around the time of the Las Vegas shooting, that again, probably no no accident. That's when the rule that's at issue here was enacted. That was in 2018 uh, is when it was enacted. Uh, in fact, just worth noting, it's during the Trump administration. There was a sort of a broad, at least at the moment, bipartisan uh, support for, for banning these things. So what these things are, what bump stocks are, is, is, is a, a sort of a method of making semi-automatic weapons fire more quickly. So a semi-automatic weapon is one where with each function of the trigger or each pull of the trigger, that ends up becoming a very important distinction here, one bullet is fired, right? So the trigger has to pop back and forth every time you use, every time you want to fire a bullet. That's different from what uh, is traditionally considered an automatic weapon, where if you just hold the trigger down, bullets will continue to fire. So when people think about machine guns, for example, that's usually what they have in mind. You hold down the trigger, it continues to shoot bullets. Semi-automatic, you have to, the trigger has to be pulled, uh, be pulled repeatedly. What bump stocks do essentially is convert the energy of the recoil from the weapon, the semi-automatic weapon when it's fired, to bump the weapon forward so that the trigger gets bumped against the finger of the shooter repeatedly, and the more quickly it happens, the more quickly it shoots. And so a well-functioning bump stock, if the person who's holding the gun keeps their finger in place and maintains the right amount of forward pressure, um, can shoot 400 to 800 times a minute. 400 to 800 times a minute? I... Yeah, I, didn't even, I didn't even think automatic weapons could fire that quickly. Yeah, apparently they can fire a thousand times a minute now. Uh, that's what um, my, uh, my understanding from reading the record is. Pretty extraordinary. Um, so you can understand why there might be some push to try to regulate them, especially when they're used in a high, high profile um, incident like, uh, like that one. Um, but there was no direct law speaking exactly to bump stock or using the phrase bump stock. Instead, right. what we have is a federal law which highly regulates machine guns and machine guns are defined under the federal statute as a weapon that automatically fires without manual reload more than one uh, bullet with a single function of the trigger. And that phrase, single function of the trigger, is really the center of this case. So in the wake of the Las Vegas shooting, ATF passed a regulation saying, we're going to treat bump stocks like machine guns because they effectively fire a wep- fire multiple shots with a single function of the trigger. They get you most of the way there. In function, there doesn't seem to be much disagreement that, that, a, that a weapon that is outfitted with a bump stock operates like a machine gun. And in fact, in a really remarkable concurring opinion in this case, Justice Alito says that exactly. He says, the Congress that enacted this rule about machine guns undoubtedly would have seen no difference between a machine gun and a semi-automatic uh, outfitted with a bump stock because they operate, in, for all intents and purposes, almost the same. But interestingly, he still found that the, He's the bump stock still with the majority. Wrong. And this is where the case comes down, right? Because the, the challenge here is not whether that's constitutional, whether it's okay to prohibit bump stocks or machine guns or any of that. There's explicitly, this is not a Second Amendment case. What it's about is, is the ATF's interpretation of that statute permissible? Right, so the statute again refers to guns that fire multiple bullets with a single function of the trigger. Uh, ATF says, well, bump stocks do that. 
And the majority, and this is a six to three decision here, uh, the majority uh, in an opinion by Justice Thomas says the ATF's uh, interpretation here is not permissible because the function, like the actual like firing mechanism of the, of the weapon requires the trigger to be reset each time, right? So even if it is bumping very, very quickly, the trigger is functioning repeatedly. So Justice Thomas says this is just the equivalent technologically of a person with a lightning fast trigger finger. If you could physically do this 400 times in a minute, you would just be like a personal machine gun and that wouldn't make you subject to regulation under the federal law. They wouldn't have a right to take away your finger. That's exactly right. They would have, have no right to, to, to limit your ability to, to, uh, to do that, um, at least just the speed of it, right? So, uh, so Justice Thomas says, this is not a machine gun under this phrasing, right? A single function of the trigger. I got to say, it sounds to me Justice Thomas's argument is very law professor-ish. <laughs> it's interesting. It's very technical, um, but in some ways it's a technical case. And actually, interestingly, his opinion, you know, we law professors, it's just words, 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 right? Justice Thomas has pictures. Uh, so in the <laughs> opinion here, actually, he takes uh, diagrams from an amicus brief filed in this case to really show how a trigger works and how it resets. And his argument, again, is just the trigger has to reset each time. That means it's functioning multiple times, right? It, I, I mean, the way I think about it, he's looking at this question kind of from the perspective of the gun, right? From the gun's perspective, it has to reset each time. And then Justice Sotomayor writes a dissenting opinion where she looks at things effectively from the perspective of the shooter, which is like, you pull your finger once, as long as you hold it in place and maintain the right pressure on the weapon, it will continue to fire. And that's the function, there's a single function and that initiates the firing sequence, which then, uh, thanks to the bump stock, will continue uh, uh, on its own. And so if you like, that's the difference between the two opinions. One, focusing on things from the perspective of the gun, the other focusing on things from the perspective of the, of the shooter. Interesting. It also seems like it was sort of arbitrary the way they defined automatic weapons. I mean, they could have defined automatic weapons based on the rate of bullets uh, that could be uh, could be shot, um, or they could have defined it in, in a different way, but they actually used the trigger in the definition. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really interesting in gun cases, and this is, this is actually true for a case that'll be argued um, in the fall of 2024, a case called Vanderstock, it's sometimes just hard to know what falls within the category. Um, so Vanderstock is a case about whether gun parts kits are subject to the same regulations as guns. So for example, if you sell, if you're in the business of selling firearms, you have to do a background check when you sell that gun to make sure the person you're selling to isn't a felon. But if you're selling a kit, which is let's say 80% finished and requires some pieces to be put together, you don't because it's technically not a gun. And so the question in Vanderstock really is, well, can the ATF regulate the gun parts kits the same way it regulates guns, right? Again, it's a definitional question. Like, what? It, when does this become a gun? Am I right that you could buy a kit and then maybe another couple of parts and then you have a full, fully functioning gun? You can go online uh, and read people's accounts of, you know, like a journalist, for example, who bought a kit and never had a gun before and how many hours it took them to put together. Or go on YouTube and see, you know, uh, methods for finishing uh, finishing receivers. Um, uh, and I've never done it, so I can't testify to how hard that is. Um, but at least some people say it's pretty easy. Yeah. And there is, a, there is a long American tradition of sort of gunsmithing. I think people like to associate themselves with that. But as a legal matter, it raises this really hard question of like, well, what is a gun? Like, when does it become a firearm? Does it, you have to wait until the firing pin is in? Like, is it when the mechanism's fully? And, and that, in some ways, I think tracks the question here of like, well, what is a machine gun is exactly the question here. Um, in the constitutional realm, we have a lot of cases about what well, the Second Amendment refers to arms. Well, what is an arm? Uh, does an arm can, you know, does that uh, cover what are sometimes called gravity knives? Does it cover nunchucks? There was a great Second Amendment case about that that then Judge Sotomayor wrote. Does it cover high capacity magazines? Like these are all category questions. It's, they're frankly just kind of hard to answer. So in some respects, this is a very narrow, lawyerly, technical case about just how to interpret these words. Um, and not about whether bump stocks are a good idea or whether they can be prohibited. It's just whether does, does this statute actually permit the ATF to regulate them like machine guns. That's a, a big point that was probably, I think, missed in the headlines, which is this isn't to say that Congress could go and ban bump stocks. Uh, this particular opinion did not prohibit that. It just said that the original decision, on the original um, Executive order, am I right? 
original text of the statute and then the agency regulation based on that statute. But you're exactly right, Joel. I mean, I think a lot of people looked at this like it's a big win for gun rights and it is a loss for gun regulation, if you like, but is emphatically not a Second Amendment case. And actually, the majority is very clear about that. This is on Congress. If Congress wants to fix it, they can. Now, that may be kind of a hollow hope. It's really hard to imagine. And at least in the days, we're only here about a week out from Cargill uh, being decided, um, you know, Congress has tried and failed to get a new bill going. It seems unlikely to me that that'll happen. But it would, it, the court here at least says that would not be, we're not deciding whether that would be a Second Amendment problem. To my knowledge, no federal court has yet weighed in on whether bump stocks are covered by the Second Amendment. But if Congress were to pass such a regulation, then we might get a case. And I guess I should also emphasize almost 20 states prohibit bump stocks. So you could have litigation against the state laws, even though there's no, there's no longer a federal regulation um, and seems unlikely to be a federal law. Joseph Bloker teaches at Duke Law School and is the co-director of the Duke Center for Firearms Law. Thanks so much for your time today on what I know has been an incredibly busy week, Professor. Thanks so much for having me, Joel. It's always a pleasure. Thank you.